Hello everyone and welcome back to Coach Quip. I'm Coach Robin. I'm Coach Chris. And today is a very timely episode, episode 155, and we're talking about the longest long run. It is nearly time. Really, if you're training for Chicago, which we know is a popular thing to do, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, this is more than likely your peak week, which means the biggest miles that you do throughout your entire training cycle. And it usually means that it's your longest long run sometime, likely this weekend. Yeah, there's a lot of stress and anxiety around the longest long run, which is why we wanted to have this conversation. So we'll get right into it. We're here, right? You've arrived. You gotta know that no matter what, you're gonna get through the week, right? I think people freak out about it Mm -hmm. because it's something they haven't done before. It's something they haven't done in a long time. But at the end of the day, you've been building to this. And if you've made it to, right, what is it, probably week 15, one five of marathon training, you've proved that you could stack bricks. And that's what this week is, just more bricks. Yeah, it's not substantially different than any other week that you've done. It's a little bit longer, right? But I definitely have athletes who have anxiety about it already. And now, you know, recording this two weeks out, like I have athletes who are dreading this one particular workout. And it really is a lot about your mindset on how you approach it. Yep, totally. And how you plan. Yes. So let's go through some of our tips for how to tackle your longest long run. You know, the first thing would be to think back it out. So not just the day of your long run, but the night before. Yep. And even, you know, to some extent, the week of, yeah, right? Yeah, 24 to 48 hours out at the very least. This is your opportunity to practice what you're going to do on race day. This means your night before routine and your night before dinner. And I think, like, you know, can't underestimate how important this is to know that the food that you're going to have is going to sit well in your system like for for that long run so anything that you would do the night before whether it's set out your kit that you're going to wear um, set out your breakfast you know all of that routine is an opportunity to just practice so that when you get to the race experience it feels like you have done it a hundred times and if you're going to practice that practice nutrition write it down just make Mm -hmm. a list because there's nothing I love more this, when I do my pre-race meetings with my athletes and I ask this exact question of like, what are you eating two days out, one day out, morning of and after? And they literally just copy and paste whatever they put in training peaks for the longest long run. Because if it works, great, right? This is your dress rehearsal for nutrition too. And yep. if it didn't work, you want to know that. Yeah, and you want to change it. Yes. <laughs> and you'll have another opportunity the next weekend too. So right. I think people... They freak out about the longest long run because they're thinking, this is it. And it's like, no, you still have two more long runs after this. And then you have the race, right? So you still have an opportunity to troubleshoot, even if there is an issue, which you want to know if there is. Yeah, and I like that even two days out, like you said, that, you know, that also can have an impact yeah. on how you feel on that Saturday morning or Sunday morning when you do that long run. So we want to make sure that we are thinking about it in terms of hydration, your electrolytes, your carb loading. That's all opportunities to practice. Write it down. Next up is to practice your morning routine. I would even say your your bedtime routine too. Practice the overall routines. This is another question that I have on my pre-race kind of rundown with my athletes is what are you going to do the night before and the morning of? And then just writing out a timetable. I mean, that was one of the best pieces of advice that my original endurance coach gave me is to literally like almost make a script and then you just follow it along because you're going to be nervous on race morning, right? Yeah. So if you can just be like, oh, 4.30 a.m., wake up. 4.40 a.m., start drinking my noon, whatever that is, you can write it out and trial it and then just copy and paste and have it ready to go for race weekend. Yeah, that's exactly why we do this, right, is so that we don't have to spend time thinking. And energy. Morning. Yeah, <laughs> like if, if you just have to follow the plan, it becomes so much easier yeah. that morning to manage other things like your intensity or your emotions, yep. you know, you, you just stick to the plan. And looking beyond the race, when you end up having a great race, right? Or let's say, God forbid, you have a tough race. Mm-hmm. You then have a recipe to look back to from a rate. We should do an episode on race reports. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're that, going to. That's going to be maybe episode <laughs> 160, something like that. Um, but, yeah. you know, it really does help. And I will have athletes, you know, of course, like personally coaching athletes that, you know, when they write their race report, they're literally referring to things that they wrote in their pre-race rundown. And then on top of that, when they go and do that race again the next mm-hmm. year, or the next, the same time they do that distance, they are going back and seeing what worked and what didn't. So it is literally all about just just writing it down and, and, and analyzing it. This is all just a big experiment. So you're trying to figure out which elements work. 
Yeah, and I think that mindset of being like this is an experiment can really help take some of the pressure yeah. off, right? It, it, like, it, it doesn't have to be. It's it's not race day, right? It is a dress rehearsal for race day. So if you can just approach it with that mindset of like, let's see what works, let's see what doesn't, you're you're going to be having a much more enjoyable experience. And something that you just said about um, you know practicing that night before routine. Uh, if you are traveling for a race, so an additional tip here, if you're, say you're training for New York and you live in Chicago or you're in New York and you're coming to Chicago or what have you, um, you see, you know, when you're traveling, it becomes a lot more difficult to yep. do that, that, uh, what am I going to eat, right? Unless you're staying somewhere and you're going to cook for yourself, it, there's big question marks there. So if you are, for example, traveling to another race and you know that you are going to find a sushi restaurant because that works well for you. Then make sure that you're having sushi before that yeah. long run, yeah. right? Like whatever it is that you're going to to do when you're traveling and you found your restaurant that you're going to go to, try that home before yeah, that. Yeah, I love run. that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So in the in the spirit of this being all about the dress rehearsal, right? We want to practice our race kit and what you're going to wear on race day. You've all heard the, uh, you know, the line, nothing new on race day, and that extends not just to your nutrition, but also to what you wear and your shoes. So this is your opportunity to make sure that it's all dialed in. Now, I would say I would advise against getting a new pair of shoes and going for a 20 mile run. In that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's not going to be the move. But if you've been breaking in a pair of shoes, this is a great opportunity to use them for a long run. On the shoes piece, if you do have a situation where you're like, oh, I want to try to use a new pair of shoes, um, and I want to try them out on my 20 miler or whatever distance you're doing this weekend, we do loops at edge. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would use that shoe, let's say for the first seven miles, and then switch back to your old shoes. You always want to do it as well when you're breaking in a new shoe or trying out a new shoe. You want to do it on the first part, not the last part, <laughs> when you're fatigued. You want to do it when your feet are fresh, and then give your body what it knows for the latter part, and that would be a really nice way to kind of ease in if you are in that. I know it's weird because we want to rush, like we want to have fresh shoes to run in and race in, but mileage-wise, it doesn't always work to be able to have them all ready to go for the full distance. So when in yeah. doubt, just use it for the first part. Yeah, that's a great tip. Uh, you know, this also extends beyond clothes and shoes. If you're going to do a hydration belt or a hydration vest in your race, like those are all things to practice. We want to make sure essentially that nothing is chafing or rubbing. Yeah. And practice with lube. Yeah. Don't forget the lube. Because if you like are, are pumped about like a hip held hydration system, but it rubs you, you're going to hate it forever. When if you would have just yep. a little bit. You know, you would, oh, sorry for everybody not watching us. Yeah. I just did like a mimic of like putting, you know, lube around your kind of waistline or wherever you need it, it you're going to be a lot more likely to have a true test. So if you're going to test something, test all of it, the system. Yeah. All right. Not surprisingly, use your race day nutrition, right? This is something else that you probably should have dialed in by now um, on your long runs. But the whole idea is that you repeat it. And then on your longest long run, which is coming up, um, you are able to use what you've done, right? You are familiar with it. You, you know your periodization. You have, if you have, you know, alarms going off on when to take it, you know what you're going to do. You know the strategy. You know that you should have pre-ordered with us to have your nutrition <laughs> in order. Don't be scrambling around. Plan now so that you have a true test because your gut needs to be trained too. Like mm -hmm. your body likes to be told what to do and when to do it. Yep. Um, and if you are short on something, ask a friend, go shopping, preferably at a small local business, um, for what you need so that you can truly, truly test it out. And I would actually argue you're going to want to practice that as well as plan your recovery after from a nutrition standpoint and refeed carbs and proteins within the 30 60 minute window after you're done so it can literally be like a you know a, a bar that contains both of those it doesn't need to be necessarily a whole meal mm -hmm. um, but putting something in because this is your biggest deposit that you put in for a week and for a single day for the entire training cycle so we really want to extend that nutrition planning until after and it's so important to help us bounce back from that long effort so this is not just about training yourself so that after your race you have a nutrition plan to accelerate recovery it's that you still have more training to do after yeah. this and we need to bounce back as quickly as we can to go into that taper period and you know actualize all of that fitness so yeah that's a great uh, a great one and then also uh, order whatever you need now or go get it from those small local businesses because in marathon season, particularly like around Chicago Stuff Marathon flies time, off the shelf. 
and sometimes it's what you use is not there. So, you know, especially if you're if you're shopping locally, which you should be, there's going to be a run on it. Or if you're ordering, we know that there was backups at the feed when yep. we changed warehouses. Like, just make sure that you have that in advance. Yeah, and you might as well order enough for race day while you're right. at it. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the longest long run. Use the power of the group. I can't tell you how many people are like, I did my whole marathon season, training season alone, and it was terrible. I don't have anybody that comes at me and is like, it was great, right? <laughs> so you should use it, right? So find your group, make the effort. Yes, it's worth it if you wake up early, especially if your race is early. Why not test everything out in real time? Um, also want to bring to your attention, I'm foreshadowing here, this is not a surprise. We've done it for the last four or five years. We are doing the last long run, not the longest long run, but the last long run on October 5th, Edge and Windrunners are hosting the last long run, which is running the last nine miles of the marathon course. We're going to be, um, by the time this airs, it'll have gone live. So it's going to be edgeathlete.me slash LLR, caps or not will work. Um, and we want obviously you to register so that we know how many people we can cap out at, but it's a really cool way to really experience how race day might feel when you need it the most, right? Because your last nine miles are going to be really special. Um, so you'll, to put it. Yeah, you'll know, <laughs> you know, things will be familiar, you'll be able to identify. I do really well being like, oh yeah, I remember this bridge, right? It just seems more familiar, especially when you're in a level of discomfort, which you're more than likely going to be at, you know, mile 20 plus. Um, it's just going to help you, help arm you with knowledge. Um, we'll start at the edge tier zone. So that's usually around mile 18, 17, 18. Um, at Halstead and Taylor. Then we'll, again, run the last nine miles of the course, and we finish right after Mount Roosevelt, um, and then just do a pop-up, and we can help shuttle a little bit gear, but we'll have a lot of transportation info on there, too. So that's another way to use the group. Of course, that's a nine-miler, not your longest long run, but it's still a super great way to get jazz. Yeah, exactly, and the, we know that the, you know, group training is so much different than individual training, like you mentioned. Um, with that, I would say anybody who's a treadmill runner, it would really benefit you to get outside for this long yes. run um the 20 miler or your longest long run your three hours and 30 minutes or whatever it is you don't want to do that on a treadmill it is very very different than running outside for that long so get outside and then when you have those other people around you you know the you, the amount of enthusiasm that happens right yeah. like it is really replicating that race experience and so whether you know longest long run or the last long run Feeding off the power of the group is really going to help promote more positive memories with that. So yeah. I love the last nine miles because if, if you and I are chatting in that and we're all excited about the race and we're just you know having the good vibes, when I get there in the race, I'm going to be able to, to draw on that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't ever think about that. That's completely true. Yep. All right. And the last thing is that it doesn't have to be perfect. So we started off this episode talking about the amount of pressure that people put on themselves like thinking that you have to nail it and if i have a bad long long run that my whole race is going to blow up but the truth is it's a dress rehearsal it is your practice and so it, there's actually some benefits to having an imperfect long run yep because there are lessons to be learned and we want to be able to tweak and, and fiddle with things before we actually get to the day where it matters the most um you had a theory on this yeah I, I say this at most of our longest long runs or even like the last two longest runs as a coach we know we don't need your longest long run to go perfectly mm -hmm. we really don't we need one of your longer long runs to go well we don't expect any of them to go perfectly in fact if it if it does go perfectly you either got really lucky with weather or nutrition or something or maybe your week was a little written a little light mm -hmm. Right, but it, more than likely, it should not necessarily be perfect. We just need one of them to go well, to have a quality deposit, and then also to kind of see the fitness peeking through. Remember, you're doing this effort on zero taper. You're doing it on the opposite of taper. Mm -hmm. We haven't used, we haven't been able to see any of the fitness just yet. So if we get a glimpse, let's say on your 17 miler, you had this amazing transcendent experience, your heart rate was in check, it wasn't a fluke. That is actually the glimpse of your fitness. So go into it knowing, look back. At, chances are you already had that really great run, so we don't need this one to be slammed on perfect. Yeah, and keep it in perspective. You're running 18, 20 miles or you know, three plus hours for that longest long run. It's going to suck. It's going to hurt. It's going to 
you know, it, I would say if it goes perfectly, then maybe you can adjust your time goals. Yeah, right? that's right. a great call. Right. Yes, get a new pace card. Right, like if, if it feels <laughs> like it down. If, if you're doing 20 and it feels easy, you are either yep. fit AF or, you know, something needs a little bit of adjusting. So it's common to feel sore afterwards because you have to look at the effort that you just did. But again, this is just your opportunity to run through all the pieces. And, you know, I think for whether it's a, a 20 mile long, longest long run or race day, what we know about racing is that nothing is guaranteed and nothing lasts forever. So sometimes you'll feel good yep. and sometimes you will feel horrible and you'll feel in neutral, you'll feel nothing. And all of those things can happen in an hour and they can all happen in a mile or in a minute. You know, the, it, it, there's no permanence yep. in racing. And so the more that we can experience all of those things in our practice, the better off you are on race day because you feel more confident and equipped to handle it. Remember, at this point of training, the real work is done. Even without peak week, the real work is done. You've done so much, we just have this little bit to go. So that last long run, the longest long run, it happens in taper when you're not really trying to gain fitness or cramp or test, you're maintaining and letting yourself recover, right, from here on out. So, all caps, <laughs> fitness only actualizes through the recovery phase, period. So after this longest long run, take that into consideration with everything that you do, whether that's legs up the wall or coming in to use tubs or making sure that you're getting good nutrition in. The next three weeks after the longest long run matters so, so much. Um, check out as well episode 108 for our taper tips, which are plentiful, and you will be able to use those as you're losing your mind during taper. <laughs> Coaches love it. Not really. Um, last thing is remember, the last long run on October 5th is open to the public. We will have a cap, and it will fill. It will hopefully not be filled by the time we go live with this because it has just gone live. Um, is edgeathlete.me slash LLR for last long run and run the last nine miles of the course. All right. You got this. Longest long run on deck. Let's go. Make notes. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Coach Quip. Original music performed by Mend. Follow us online on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Edge Athlete Lounge. Our podcast lives in the blog section of our website. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And you can check out the show notes for additional ways to contact us. Ready, set, onward we go.